Well, good morning. I just want to uh, take a, a, a quick second and introduce uh, Scott Bruns. Um, he's been the executive director at Scioto Hills, I believe, since 06, when him and Pam made the uh, cross-country venture over from Colorado. For some reason, Scioto Hills is like a, a transplant of Colorado, it seems like. A lot of people that currently work there and have worked there in the past have come from Colorado, so it's like a, a migrant place, I guess. But um, I just want to welcome Scott. Scott is a, such a sweet guy. Um, when you're down at Scioto Hills, um, as our family has been now, I think three straight summers, you can't have a conversation with Scott when he doesn't um, press you to love Jesus more. Um, he is a, just a, a guy I cherish uh, greatly. I love having brief conversations with him down there. And Libby and I always joke that, uh, you know, you'll have a teacher in the morning and a teacher in the evening for family camp. And then Scott will come up and just kind of put a bow on everything. And I find that those three to four minute bows that he will uh, put on top of things are just nuggets that you can take away and uh, chew on for many, many days and months ahead. He's a, a neat guy, um, love him dearly. I know he's been a blessing to Libby as well. So I bring Scott up here, I'll pray for him, and then he, uh, he'll have the show from here. So appreciate him coming two and a half hours this morning. So Lord, thank you for Scott. Um, thank you for his um, heart for you. Um, he leads um, a staff down at Scioto Hills and leads them and points them to you. We thank you for that. Thank you for the ministry that they do in so many people's lives. Um, it's just such a neat experience and camp works on people in so many ways. We're thankful for that and for his leadership and for Pam's leadership as well. Um, I just pray you'd bless his time um, here this morning. Pray that uh, you would give him the words to say, Lord, we are incapable of saying anything fancy or anything um, without your help. And Lord, we just need to hear from you. You, Scott, um, be a, allow him to be a conduit for you. We thank you for him. Open hearts this morning um, to lead us to continue on in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, brother. Good to be here. We'll start over. <laughs> I don't know what you're in for, but you know, people say when I preach, they compare me to Charles Swindoll. And they say, compared to Chuck Swindoll, you're not very good at this, are you? So, so we'll see what happens. I do want to give you a camp report uh, real quickly here uh, before we look into the word. But uh, when the, uh, down by us, they call it the Rona. When the Rona hit, um, you know, in 2019, 2020, there in April, or so we weren't sure what was going to happen like many of us, right? They were uncharted waters. But we knew right away uh, two things were going to be true about Scioto Hills. One, God was going to be faithful. And I'll just tell you that we are an arm of the local church and God has commanded Jesus himself said that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And so we know we're going to be okay because we are an arm of the church because the church is going to be Okay, so we understood that God was going to be faithful, and then through this whole thing, regardless of where it went, because we were all wondering if we were even going to close, uh, we knew there were going to be new God stories that he would give us. And just to give you uh, maybe the, the biggest one, while there are many, uh, the biggest one is simply that God was faithful throughout the whole uh, ordeal. We uh, on a $900,000 camp budget we lost in 2020, we lost a half a million dollars of earned income. But in 2020, we had $470,000 in gift income. And every time I looked at the, the balance in our checkbook, I kept wondering uh, uh, and thinking about a number that was going to be in there. Uh, and the number was always bigger than I thought. And there's so many stories I could tell you about the faithfulness of God's people and churches that, that uh, stepped up that I didn't even know existed and folks that had written notes and said the Saudi Hills had blessed us and here and there. Uh, one widow lady called me and said, hey, if I gave the camp $5,000 a month for five months, would that help? And I said, yes, it would. It's the closest thing I've experienced, uh, and I don't even like to compare it to that, but Elisha and the widow and the vats of oil that just continually filled. Every time I went to look at our checkbook, there was just always money. We never had to lay off anybody. There's nine families that live at camp. We never missed a paycheck. 
And we never once had to uh, draw from our reserve funds uh, that we have. God was faithful. And uh, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. We are planning, uh, Lord willing, uh, uh, our plan is to run a full slate of summer camps. And we now run 16 retreats a year. We, we've got a mother-daughter uh, retreat going on this morning. Some of your uh, ladies are there uh, this weekend. And uh, we are planning again now, after two years of absence, to have kids camps again. And uh, looking forward to that. I brought some little uh, reminder cards. You might have gotten something in the mail. We'll be working on our uh, brochures that will be coming out around the new year. So we're delighted to be able to introduce uh, Kids Camp again with some new twists and some different things. We're going to start on Sunday nights instead of Monday mornings and uh, try a few things that are different that we've learned uh, over the course of the last two years. Um, Two things to pray about, if you would. Uh, pray about our need to recruit summer staff. Uh, the way we run camp, we hire about 50 to 55 college and high school students. Uh, and if you're here and that uh, is one of you, college or high school student uh, over the age of 16, you're looking for a ministry opportunity this summer, uh, talk to us. We'd love to do that. We're, we're concerned because we lost two years of momentum since we didn't hire summer staff the last uh, two seasons. And so uh, we are about that. Our guys are out. I've been to Cedarville. They're going to Boyce tomorrow and uh, doing some different things. So pray for us to be able to recruit and hire the right summer staff team to help us pull off a great successful summer. The other thing is uh, pray for camps. You know, you all know we live in crazy times, right? And uh, can I get a name? No, we don't have to do that. But um, Camps are going to be attacked in different ways um, because we do overnight stuff and we do boy stuff and we do girl stuff. And there are a lot of things coming down um, and uh, I don't know, maybe for lack of a better word, threats uh, that are happening. And we just want to be true to God's word. Pray, pray regardless of what happens that we are true to God's word and that we'll stand firm on what we believe to be truth and be able to promote and use our uh, hills as a platform for the gospel. All right, let's uh, invite you to find John chapter six. I know you're uh, doing some studies in Psalm, uh, Psalms this uh, month, but I just felt the Lord wanted us to go here today. Uh, John chapter six will also be uh, in Mark chapter eight as well. Uh, and we simply have titled uh, the message today, The Faith Test. If you're taking notes, um, it would be uh, this simple idea. Uh, Point number one, faith test number one, John chapter six. Point number two, faith test number two, Mark chapter eight. Um, The faith test, the idea of faith, we talk about faith at Siley Hills, we talk about placing the full weight of your life in Christ. We, we love that definition, and it works well because we have a 40-foot climbing wall that you put a harness on, and you step off of it to go on a zip line, and you trust the weight, your full weight of your life in those cables and in that harness, right? Or we have trust falls, or we have a 50-foot giant swing that you have to pull that ripcord and trust the harness, put the full weight of your life, you're helpless, put the full weight of your life in trusting that rope. God wants us, Christ wants us to put the full weight of our life in him. Every part of it, not just our salvation, but every element of our life to put the full weight of our life in him. And if there's a theme to that, it would be this idea that we need to recognize there are those things that we cannot do. There are also those things then we need to trust that Jesus, God, can do. And as a result of that, then there are those things that he wants us to do that we can do. So I want to ask you a question uh, this morning as we start. Um, What is the one thing in your life that you believe God can get you through, but you are still struggling to give him control over it. What's the one thing in your life 
that you know God can get you through, and yet you still struggle deep down in your heart. You struggle with whether or not God is going to get you through that. For me, uh, it has always been not my personal finances. It's interesting that my wife says, uh, you are concerned about camp finances, but you're never concerned about our finances. I said, well, you can, you know, she does a great job of taking care. But my concern is for finance. And, and I'm just amazed over and over that I know God can get me through. And yet, even though he's got me through another stage of camp, I'm always going back to wondering whether or not that's going to continue to be true. For my wife, the big thing, if, if you talk to her, I wish she could be with you today. Uh, she's on a, a panel this morning at the retreat. But um, for her... It's her concern and burden more so maybe than mine for our adult children who have claimed Christ and yet aren't living uh, the way that we would love to see them live. You know, when you you grow up and this is our 42nd year in ministry and you have these dreams for your kids and and all three of our boys are out of the home and married and uh, she is burdened uh, about them and she knows We prayed last night. She knows that God can take care of it, and yet she wants to do things that she can't do just to let God do. What's that one thing that's on your mind? Now, if you've grown up in the church, John chapter 6, you'll know that this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Mark chapter 8 is the feeding of the 4,000. And we learned that this was a story about a little boy who was so nice to give Jesus his five loaves and two fish. And that somehow Jesus took those five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. That's the story I heard. But I'm here to tell you today, that's not the point of John chapter 6. In fact, I think the disciples took the little boy's bread and and fish, and he didn't have much to do with it. The story in John chapter 6, folks, listen, is about the greatness of Christ. And the greatness of Christ and his ability to meet our needs. Every one of them. So let's look at it here. So John chapter 6, I'm reading in the English Standard Version. After this, after what? Well, let me just say John the Baptist had just been killed by Herod. We have that situation. We have Jesus arguing with the Pharisees because in John chapter 5, he had healed a man who'd been by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, and they're complaining about the guy taking up his mat and walking with his mat, and it was breaking the law. Oh, my word. God forbid we ever get there. He's having these arguments, this discussion with them, and it was also the time, folks, where the disciples had been with Jesus long enough to know who he was and to know what he was doing and know what he could do. They'd seen the healings. They were there at the the, uh, wedding at Cana. And John mentions seven major miracles. uh, But if you read Matthew's account and you read Mark's account, what you have is Jesus going back and forth. You have the the, uh, the, the, uh, Sea of Galilee there, and they're always moving from one shoreline to another, back and forth, and crowds are starting to follow them. And it says in a number of places that Jesus was healing many. All those who touched his garment were healed, blind, lame, uh, deaf people. Uh, he's, he's made sick people that are on their deathbed alive again, uh, giving them health. And they've seen that. They've been with him long enough to see what he could do. There's a lot of us here that have been with him long enough to testify what he can do, and yet we still struggle to put the full weight of our life in him. Man. So this is, this is for us about Christ's Greatness. So after this, this is the first faith test. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. 
Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand. We'll stop there just a second. So again, I just want you to get this idea. Once he started healing, and uh, I don't know how the series The Chosen is going to show that. They're going to just have to hire thousands and thousands of people uh, in, their, in that TV series. But he's going from one place to another. He gets away from them by getting in a boat, and they just follow around on the shore. And then another crowd comes, and he goes somewhere else, and another crowd comes. And they're just hanging on his every word, and they want to see what he's going to do next. And the Passover is at hand, and these Jewish followers would have understood and been thinking about the rescue from Egypt with the uh, blood on the doorpost, right, and the uh, death angel passing over, and they would have been looking at a rescuer, and then they move into the 40 years in the wilderness, and they receive bread from heaven, manna. It's on their minds. Jesus is the perfect and the best teacher uh, available to anyone. So now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand and lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Interestingly, Matthew says, hey, you give them something to eat. Here John says, where are we to buy bread? This is the first test. Where do we buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, Philip. To test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. So the first test comes. Philip, I want you to place the full weight of your life in me. Where can we uh, get bread to feed all these people? And by the way, folks, we know that it was 5,000 men here in John chapter 6, and Mark tells us that they would put people, uh, they could count them, uh, and they put them in groups. And what the Jews did when they were in gatherings, they would meet in 10 50s or 100 groups, and it would be men that they would count, and they would pray that in groups, and depending on the number, the prayer changed. I don't know all those details, but it's pretty, how would they know 5,000? Well, they put them in groups, but it's not just 5,000, as we remember as a kiddo, it was 5,000 men, and we don't know how many of them had their wife and kids with them, but I estimate that there probably were somewhere around 20,000 people. Somewhere like that. So the faith test is, Philip, uh, where can we get bread? And he fails the test. Wait, if we had 200 denarii, a year's salary, we wouldn't be able to buy enough bread to feed everyone to where they would just get a little bit. Peter, I'm sorry, Philip, fails the test. See, what you have here is this idea, and, and Jesus says he did it to test him, to teach him, uh, not to trick him, but to help him grow in his faith. So Philip recognizes there's something that he can't do. He can't possibly feed these people. We have to do the same thing. There are things that only Christ can do, and he's the one who can do it. He knew he was going to do it. He knew what he was going to do before it happened. He already knew that there was a kiddo with five loaves and two fish, right? We have to remember there are things we can't do. There are things that he can do. Well, here we go. We got a second part of this thing. So one of his disciples, Andrew, this is verse 8, Simon Peter's brother said to him, uh, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Andrew fails the test. We can't do this. It's impossible. We can't do it. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Oh, there's something the disciples can do, right? Uh, help these people sit down. Uh, he's going to take care of what you can't take care of. But there are things that he always calls us to be doing. There are things that we know we should be doing, things that he teaches us uh, to be doing. 
All right, so now there was, grass, uh, there was much grass in the place, so the, the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. Not just a little, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. There is a principle I found out that uh, when they had feasts like this, they would collect extras and they would always try to give uh, of the total amount, they tried to give 4%. I don't know where that number comes from. Just history uh, tells us that they would try to give 4% to the priest. So they collected these fragments already broken in the pieces um, and uh, some commentators think that they probably were going to save that for the priest because that was part of uh, the commands from the Old Testament. So Jesus didn't just feed everyone. He made a little more than we needed. Jesus didn't just meet our bill uh, each week. At camp, he gave us a little more than what we needed. Always. All right. So, verse 13. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. These are um, smaller baskets. These are a beggar's basket. This is a smaller basket. Um, We're going to see in Mark 8 that it's a larger basket, but the word that is used here is the word we use for what they would call a beggar's basket. So when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who had come into the world. Finally, the one we've been waiting for, the one that the Old Testament pointed us to, is now here, and uh, Jesus knows their hearts and their mind. This guy's a miracle worker. He's doing some incredible things, and, and we want to have him come and now take over the Roman uh, government because they got that confused at times. Jesus would dealt with that with his disciples at different times and with others that wanted him to overthrow the Roman government and, and establish his kingdom. But let me just say, there's a difference between the wonderful and the impossible. When's the last time? I get a rush. I do a garden at camp. I get a rush from putting seeds in the ground and growing them in my little greenhouse and uh, putting them in the ground, putting a little fertilizer in and watch those things grow and pick fruit or vegetables from them. And by the way, tomatoes are a fruit, so you know, we can grow them that way. I get a rush from that, and it never gets old. That's wonderful, right? That's part of God's providence and creation that seeds produce after their own kind. But what Jesus does, folks, is impossible. Big difference. He feeds 20,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And it's, it's incredible what he does, right? Now, remember we said, this is not a story about the little boy. It's a story about Christ's greatness. So let's go on here and keep, keep going. So Jesus, verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So he's either going in a boat getting away or he's going off into the desert area away from the people to get away. Now, I think the writers had in mind that there's this idea of going to camp. I'll just tell you, it could be a stretch on the text. And we don't have mountains, but we've got hills at Sciota Hills. So Jesus sends them away. If you read the other passages and things, Jesus sends them away, the disciples away and he goes in the mountain. Now, we need to keep going here just a little bit before we transition to Mark chapter 8. When evening came, verse 16, his disciples went down the, the sea, got into the boat, boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had yet come to pass. I'm sorry, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough, 
because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And here's another miracle. And immediately the boat was on the land to which they were going. This is the same story uh, that Mark and Matthew tell us. Mark tells us that Peter saw Jesus. And by the way, Jesus was planning to pass by them, Mark says. Um, Maybe something to do with the Passover. Possibly his greatness passing before them. He's up in the mountain. He saw them struggling uh, uh, in the water at dark. And you didn't want to be in the sea, you know, in the first century at night. No LED lights, right? And Jesus is passing by them. They see him, gets in the boat. And that's the the time when Peter says, let me come to you. Think about that. That's not just wonderful. That's impossible. Peter walks on the water. No one else got out. We always kind of criticize him for not having the faith. And Jesus says, why did you doubt me? Isn't that the question for us when we face that, those struggles that we have as well? Uh, why do you doubt? And there's times when he says, oh, you have little faith, right? Man. So they get on the shore, and the story continues. Let's now switch to the second point, would be Mark chapter 8. In the second faith test. Again, in the boat, going across the Sea of Galilee, uh, Bethesda, Bethesda, uh, Capernaum, other places, Delmutha, uh, different regions, desert regions all around. And uh, basically, it's just like he's in this boat going back and forth. Crowds are running around the, the shoreline and constantly following him. Can't get away from him. So here's the second uh, point, the faith test, the second uh, faith test. Chapter 8. In those days, John said in chapter 6 after this, well, in those days, we now have some more time. Probably John chapter 6 is in April sometime. This is probably a few months Later, uh, he's done much more healing. The crowds are getting bigger. Uh, He's uh, uh, doing all kinds of incredibly impossible things to verify that he is the son of God. In fact, John chapter five, the reason that the Pharisees got so upset with him is because they knew he was claiming to be God. They didn't like that. So in those days, When again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd. There's probably a whole message in that related to us being like Jesus with the people that we rub shoulders with and the people we do life with. Jesus had compassion on the crowd because they had been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And, I've, and I send them, and if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. There is something to say about meeting the physical needs of people before you can help meet their spiritual needs uh, as well. And his his disciples answered him, how can one, look look at the wording here, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? So we got this failing again. It's what they can't do. They don't get it. We can't do this. How can anyone do? How can one person, it's interesting, how can one, they're forgetting that Jesus is the one that can, right? How can one feed all these people And yet Jesus knows that he is the one who can do it. He's trying to help them understand that he can do it. But he's trying to do something that's bigger, and we're not going to take time to do that. But if you look at John chapter 7, you'll find out the reason for the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. It's to introduce this idea that Jesus says, if you eat of me, you'll never hunger again. I'm the bread of life. 
one of the great I am's there in the book of John. I have everything you need to sustain you, and especially I have everything you need to attain salvation and to inherit the kingdom of God. So there was this thing, again, they couldn't do, and the thing that Jesus could do. So he answers them in verse five, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the people, and they set uh, them before the crowd. So there again, it's what they can do. What they can't do, what Jesus can do, and what we can do, what they could do. They can do those things that he asked them to do. They weren't impossible. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to these, also should be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And this is the word for merchant's basket. So before, it was a beggar's basket full, 12, and now you've got a merchant's basket carrying uh, a number of loaves of bread that they would take to market to sell, and he has seven of those left over. And he says here in verse uh, 9, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. Interesting, he doesn't say 5,000 or 4,000 men. He says people. So probably here, uh, Mark is letting us know there is probably a total of 4,000. It's not, the number doesn't matter a whole lot other than it's a lot of people, and he once again does this miracle. So he sent them away, and he immediately got in a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Delmutha. So he's moving again. He's on the move, right? Sends the crowd away. Crowd's going to go around. Pharisees are watching him, seeing what's going on. Here's what happens. We're almost done now. Hang with me a little longer. Now they have forgotten to bring bread. I'm sorry, I missed it. Go back to verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. A sign from heaven to test him. They question him about raising the lame man. He's been healing blind people. He's been raising people from the dead. He's been feeding thousands and thousands of people, and now they still want another sign. Why? Because they don't have the faith to believe. Why? Because John tells us that they're not his sheep. They're not going to believe. But they came to test him, not to learn from him, but to catch him in a snare, to try to catch him in a trap. That's what they were doing all along. They are looking for something to accuse him of. And so he sighed deeply huh, in his spirit, and he says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now, we know from Mar uh, Matthew's account that he says, except for the sign of Jonah, Three days, right? Three nights, dead, alive, that whole idea. Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, the Pharisees. He got into a boat again and went to the other side, constantly going back and forth. So here's where we want to finish. Verse 14. So he's in a boat with the disciples. The disciples had seen him feed thousands and thousands of people with a few loaves of bread. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and beware of the leaven of Herod. What Jesus is referring to is the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the contradictory, hypocritical type of life that Herod was living as a Jewish king and the idea that they somehow were promoting these ceremonies and they were more important than worshiping God. And he's trying to help his closest friends understand. He just got done arguing with the Pharisees again. He's trying to help them understand the danger of their religious leaders who had drifted from truth 
and it created all kinds of new things. And they de-emphasized and were rejecting Christ. And so he says, watch out. But look at how they respond. Verse 16, and they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Well, Philip, weren't you supposed to bring the bread along? Uh, well, I thought John was going to do it. Well, hey, Judas, what, you've got the money. Think about that, right? So they're discussing that they don't have enough bread to eat. Jesus, aware of this, says to them, why are you discussing the fact that we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Don't you get it? Don't you get it? Are your, look at all these questions. Are your hearts hardened? Look, pause, and look to chapter 6. Verse 45, this is right after the feeding of the 5,000. They get in the boat. Mark tells us he meant to pass by them. Verse 49 comes, he walks, and he gets in the boat. Don't be afraid, same thing. And look at verse 51. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did They did not understand about the loaves. They didn't get that Jesus had just done the impossible. They were seeing the the wonder of it, but they were not connecting that this Jesus is the Son of God, God himself in the flesh, and he's proving to them and to those around he's who he says he is, and they need to trust him completely. They need to put the full weight of their life in him. And Then he says this, and they were utterly astonished, verses 52, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. It means to be rendered stupid. And so literally Jesus here in the next chapter could say, are you guys stupid? It's okay to use that word sometimes. Proverbs uses the word, and it it says, uh, he who rejects wisdom is stupid. He who rejects Christ being the son of God and who he is would be hardened. They would be rendered stupid. They're not getting it, right? And we battle with the same thing. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? In chapter, in the, uh, later in the chapter, he's going to heal another blind man. He uses that illustration about uh, them not being able to see the truth. And when a blind man's eyes are open, uh, that's a picture of the gospel and the truth of, of, of uh, having vision about uh, Christ, right? Do you have eyes, but you do not see, and have ears, but you do not hear? Verse 31, chapter 7, he just healed a deaf man. So he's using these illustrations not being able to hear the gospel. God opens our ears to the gospel. We hear and we believe. Don't you get it? It's what he's saying. So here he goes, more questions. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? They said, and I can kind of hear it together, they're saying 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken, <clears throat> excuse me, pieces did you take up? And I think it's even more sheepishly here, and they said, seven. And he says to them, do you not yet understand? Don't you get it? This is not about bread. This is about my greatness. This is about Christ. It's about his redemption plan and his ability as the son of God to provide all of their needs and to meet all of their needs. And here we are, 20 centuries later, still struggling with the same thing. Because one side of us says, yes, Jesus can do it. And another side of us says, "Ah." and we need a shot in the arm that says, don't we get it? Don't we get it? This is not about bread. It's never been about bread. 
It's about Jesus being the bread of life. It's about Jesus being uh, the greatest. It's about Jesus being able to meet our every need. Folks, I want you to be encouraged today. Three things to finish with. One, be encouraged. Christ's power is inexhaustible. God can do in one second what would take Southgate Baptist Church millions of years to do. God can do in one second what would take hundreds and hundreds of people, 10 times as many folks as you have here, to come. He can do in one second. Be encouraged, right? Christ's power is inexhaustible. Be encouraged. Because he uses what we have. And the stories, a few loaves of bread and a few fish. He can use us. He'll use us in spite of us. We talk about that at camp all the time. He just wants us to be faithful. But he uses us in spite of us. He will use you in spite of you. And your shortcomings and your, your failures and, and your struggle and battle with temptation. And uh, because you're a son or a daughter of God, he will use you and he'll use what you have. And you all have something to be used. And then finally, be encouraged. Don't just say, he's got this, right? He's got the Rona. He's got the whole Rona in his hand. He's got it. He's God. I stand before you. I've been saved since I was 16. It's our 42nd year of ministry. And uh, I'm learning to pass the test more accurately, more intentionally, more consistently. I trust you are as well. Put the full weight of your life in Christ. Father, thank you so much for today, for the time we've had together. Thank you for the health that you've provided we know we live in a crazy, crazy society right now that, that are, they're turning things upside down and, and folks don't know right from wrong and yet we know uh, truth and we know truth is wrapped up in the person of your son. I pray that the Southgate Baptist Church would be a church from these days forward that pass the faith test knowing there's stuff that they can't do there's just things they can't do. But there are those things that you can do and will do. You'll be the one responsible for transformation, for healing, for conviction, for relationships. But there's also those things that Southgate Baptist Church, the body of Christ here, can do. And I ask that through the Holy Spirit that you make each person sensitive to that. It has been prayed earlier by Brother Mike that, that uh, we would be unified in that. We look forward to hearing good reports and sharing in the joys to see that you're not done with your church. You're not done uh, with Southgate. You've taken them through waters that are difficult and yet you want them to see the greatness of your son, who he is and what he'll do in their life. Thank you for our time. In Christ's name, amen.